There we go. And folks should be rolling on in. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for being here today. I'm going to get started because we have a tight schedule. Um, my name is Adam Desjardins. I'm the programs manager at Culture Source. Um, we are here today for our online biannual member meeting, and we're really excited to have you all joining us. Um, rolling in, it's, the numbers are growing and growing and growing. We've got 180 people registered today, so we're really excited um, for the program. Um, so again, my name is Adam Desjardins. I'm the programs manager at Culture Source. Culture Source is a regional arts and cultural organization based in Southeast Michigan. Uh, we work to serve the seven counties of Southeast Michigan and all the arts organizations and artists and creative people within them. Um, what that means for us is we have a membership base of over 175 organizations, um, which is really exciting. And there's just a lot of really amazing creative work happening in all of our communities. Um, near and far. Um, we do our work through programs like this one that you're at today. Um, usually we do those in person too, but you know, hey, we're making it work online. We also do that through re-granting initiatives um, to support creative work in the region. And then also we do that through research, um, which is a newer wing of our work um, to help inform decisions and trends and basically, you know, see what's happening in terms of the arts and cultural sector here in Southeast Michigan. Um, so today we're here for our online biannual member meeting, which is a biannual event. We do it twice a year and we're really excited to get things rolling because um, we have a really awesome lineup today. Um, a little bit of background on our biannual member meeting. So this is something that we've done for the past couple of years. This is the program we did in October of 2019 at Andy, um, a site in Northwest Detroit. Um, and we had Laura Zabel from Springboard for the Arts, and it was a really wonderful in-person event. You know, since we can't really do in-person events right now, we're really um, thrilled to, you know, be able to do it online, but still missing what in-person events are for our sector and for our society. Um, that said, in March, on March 12th of 2020, um, we were going to have our biennial member meeting, the spring version at um, Mary Groves um, Arts and Culture, um, department. Um, but after setting up, we canceled the event because the nation went into lockdown. So, um, you know, we were really bummed to have canceled that event. But looking back, um, you know, a lot has changed and a lot of things have happened, but we're glad that you're here now. Um, and so kind of on that note of being here now, um, I'd like to read something from Adrian Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy, um, just as a little bit of a grounding um, piece before getting us rolling. Um, so wherever you are beginning this, or where, wherever you are currently, um, take a deep breath and notice how you feel in your body, how the world around you feels. Take a breath for the day you have had so far, and take a breath for this precious moment which cannot be recreated. Now another for the day and night coming. Here you are in the cycle between the past and the future, choosing to spend your miraculous time in the exploration of how humans, especially those seeking to grow liberation and justice, can learn from the world around us and how to best collaborate, how to shape change. Um, so just wanted to offer that as, you know, a sort of grounding little opening, um, especially knowing that, you know, we are here in our communities and our homes and places, um, but we are also all here together right now too. Um, a little bit of a breakdown very quickly. Um, we have Nina Simon here today from Of By For All joining us all the way from California. So we're really excited to kick the meeting off. After our conversation with Nina, we'll be doing a 30 minute little break um, in breakout rooms, which will take us to a separate Zoom call. I'll be placing that link in the chat box. Um, so feel free to join us for that, or also just feel free to take a 30 minute break. Um, then we'll be you know, rejoining here uh, at 2.15 for a presentation from Deluke Smith from the Lewis Prize for Music, where we'll have um, some respondents um, locally from We Are Culture Creators, Youth Arts Alliance, and Mosaic Youth Theater. So PAC program, um, one last thing is to thank you, our thanks to our partners. Um, we have lots of really wonderful partners who um, support our work and also help us think about and strategize our work too. So that's all for me. I'm gonna pass it over to our executive director, Omari Rush, and we'll get rolling. Good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon where I'm calling in from at least. Again, my, um, as Adam introduced me, I'll go ahead and reintroduce myself and say that uh, I'm Omari Rush, Executive Director of Culture Source, and um, and really pleased to be with you all. And um, I echo all the sentiments that Adam shared about how 
you know, sad we are that we can't be together in person, but, um, you know, really happy to still be able to find a way and, um, you know, using all the digital and online tools we can to still connect with you, our members, um, current and prospective. Um, you know, Adam talked a little bit about our biennial meeting of, of, of the past. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, encourage you all to stay, stay tuned and stay in touch with Culture Source. We have some, I'd like to think, very exciting things coming up. Um, we'll soon be announcing, you know, um, a funding program with funding partners in the region, all about innovation and experimentation and risk taking. So look out for that. We also, um, again, know that you all are doing your work differently, um, oftentimes online these days. And so we'll be launching an in-depth and ongoing focus on um, digital technology and the arts and the intersection of those two things to um, both, you know, explore um, newness and also um, just pretty standard, um, straightforward tools that you can use to stay connected to your audiences and also create, um, exhibit, present, um, curate work. We also, um, you know, are really proud to have just, um, you know, closed our Creators of Culture um, funding program and are really pleased with the artist and venue grantees that we were able to um, get grants to. We'll be announcing um, who those folks are very soon. We're proud of that group. And, um, and finally, uh, early December, we're going to um, be kicking off another ongoing focus. This time it's going to be on representational justice. It's one of the ways that we are programmatically going to be focusing on issues of equity and diversity in our work. Um, we hope it's going to be a real model for you um, in your own work and that you just learn a lot. So again, please stay tuned to Culture Source. If you're not subscribed to our emails, please do that. Um, now, you know, um, maybe Adam can put the subscribe link into the chat. Um, you know, I would also um, say, you know, Culture Source as a coalition of creative people and cultural organizations, um, we are primarily uh, focused on helping those folks have positive community connections. That is, we want those folks to exist in people's lives in ways that make folks happy, um, intellectually stimulated, healthier, artistically vibrant, all the things, but we just are hoping that those folks exist in their neighbors' lives positively. And as we think about the um, environment that we're living in and the way that it's getting only more complex, we absolutely thought of Nina Simon, um, CEO and founder of Of By For All, as a great ally and partner in helping us think about how we might all exist in this, um, in this world of growing complexity and, um, and still do really creative and fun, fun programs and serve our communities. And so, um, Nina, I really appreciate you being here with us. Um, and sharing your insights about positive community connections, creativity, all the things. And um, we'll now turn it over to you for um, some opening remarks before we get into a little bit of Q&A. Great. Thanks, okay. Nina. Thank you, Omari. And thank you all so much uh, for having me. Um, I'm going to put, I'm going to share screen in a minute for slides. And I'm also putting in the chat a link where you can download these slides later if you want to come back to them. Um, so I'm going to go into present mode. Um, and I also want to uh, acknowledge and appreciate that I'm joined today by two colleagues from um, our team, Vanessa Romalho and Raquel Thompson, um, who I know will enjoy getting to chat with y'all as well. Um, so as I was thinking about what to share today, I, as in these opening remarks, I was really thinking about the work that any of us might do in choosing to change. And when we think about what it means to build more equitable organizations, um, I think a lot about the choices that we might have to make for that to be possible. Um, so I'd actually love to start with a poll. Adam, can you make the poll exist for us? Okay, awesome. Um, we're gonna give everybody a minute um, to go ahead and answer this poll. They just pick the answer that feels um, most true to you at this time. No one's gonna hold you to this. So if you're deliberating between two, just go ahead and pick one. 
20 more seconds. All right, good opportunity to get in that last response if you haven't been able to yet. Um, and Adam, if you could show us the results. Wow, awesome. Okay, so here in this group, fully more than half of you said, if you were offered a blank check for your organization right now, you would use it to radically reinvent what you're doing. Um, that's incredible to see. Um, I also say this is the first group I've ever seen where nobody said let the existing organization die, uh, which to me says that everybody here um, sees hope and possibility in your organizations. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that while the majority of people would like to radically reinvent, about half of us would like to come back to normal or would like to support others during this time. Um, and I think this is important. I'm going to close this um, because when we think about what it takes to change, I think that it fundamentally starts not with do we have the money, do we have the resources, but do we choose to use the resources we have in the direction of change. Um, and so I thought what I could offer today was just a couple of very specific ways you might be able to play with choosing to change in the direction of equity and inclusion. Um, so as, oh, uh, and I'll just note again, if you want the slides, here they are, um, and, and we'll put that in the chat as well. Um, just a couple basics. Um, so I'm here from a nonprofit called Of By For All. We are a small team that works with organizations around the world that are on journeys to become of, by, and for the communities around them. Um, we're working with organizations in the arts, as well as libraries, parks, science organizations, and I wanted to particularly call out our three organizations in Michigan, Marshall Frederick Sculpture Museum in Saginaw, Sloan Longway uh, Museum and Planetarium in Flint, and the Public Media Network in Kalamazoo. I know they're on the west side, but um, just wanted to appreciate them for a moment here. And wanted to appreciate that all 75 of these organizations are organizations that are making a deliberate choice to change and getting some support um, from each other and from our team in doing so. And I think that in a time like right now, there's a lot of conversation about the need to change. There are a lot of people talking about the desire to change, but I think what actually enables us to make change is choosing actively to do so. You know, I think there are some people out there, maybe a lot of white people like myself, who feel like maybe if I just read enough articles on Medium, I will magically metamorphosize and change. Uh, it will passively run through me and happen. In my experience, this is not actually how change happens, at least not on an organizational level, that I really think that if we want to see change happen in our organizations, in our art sector, in our communities, we have to make deliberate choices in that direction. And so today, again, I want to offer just two very specific ways we've been supporting these organizations in choosing to change, two ways that you might, oh, sorry, there's a giant fax machine behind me, um, two ways that you uh, might want to choose uh, in your own work as well. Um, so I want to start with this question of what do you choose to change? And I invite you in thinking about this, maybe you already have a long list, or maybe you're unsure. And I invite you to start by thinking about questions like these. What wasn't working for you before the pandemic? What was unjust? What do you never, ever want to go back to and do again? And one way to think about this kind of choosing to change is to think about it in terms of unlearning. This idea not of choosing to do or build something new, but choosing to start by letting go of that which no longer serves you. Um, to me, unlearning is a deliberate effort. It's a kind of work. Uh, it's like planting a garden. You can't just start by laying down seeds right away. You have to start by pulling weeds, healing the soil, setting up room to grow. I also just want to acknowledge that the term unlearning um, is being used quite often right now in the world of anti-racist work. Um, there are people like Rachel Cargill, um, who runs and leads The Great Unlearn, which is a series of online courses around the opportunity, particularly for white people, but for all of us, to think about how we might unlearn some of the ways that white supremacy culture or colonizer culture might impact the way we move through the world and the work that we do. 
When it comes to arts and arts organizations, I invite you to think about what you might choose to work to unlearn. What wasn't working before that you would choose to change. And we've heard from people all across the spectrum, from focusing on small things to huge things, focusing on institutional things to personal things. You know, one of the members in our, in our um, program said this, she said, you know, our biggest breakthrough has actually been consensus about how and who our museum is failing. And our acknowledgement of some practices which condition community misengagement or non-engagement to persist. And she basically realized with her team that they had to unlearn a lot of things, a transactional approach to working with communities, an assumption that certain communities were only interested in certain things or were only capable of being involved in certain ways, that if they could unlearn those things, perhaps they could build the kind of trusted relationships, the kind of sustainable involvement they really sought. So there are institutional approaches to this. There are also personal approaches to this. Uh, this is a quote from Brad Powell. Uh, he's um, a mid-level educator working in orchestras in Canada. And he wrote this really beautiful piece talking about what he felt orchestras needed to unlearn. But he started with this personal acknowledgement that he wanted to unlearn his own complicity with systems he disagreed with, and perhaps to unlearn some of the limitations he had put on his own power to make change. And then we are also seeing some examples of full-scale institutional unlearning. Um, this is a quote from the board chair of a contemporary arts organization in Oregon called Yale Union, which earlier this year um, gave their building debt-free to a native arts organization called the Native Arts and Culture Foundation. And in talking about this transfer of the property, um, the board chair talked about this idea that it's not a gift, um, it's not about generosity, it's about his organization unlearning their own complicity with this assumption that it's okay um, for white organizations to amass a lot of resources, that it's okay for settlers um, to steal and use native land. And so wherever you are on this spectrum, perhaps thinking about an institutional practice you want to unlearn, perhaps a personal perspective you want to unlearn, perhaps something that takes your whole institution in a new direction. Um, I, I wanna just note that all three of these examples um, and many examples of unlearning in the arts are being driven and have been driven by people of color. Indigenous people, black and brown people for quite a long time have been leaders in calling for change, in calling for us to stop certain practices to make room for something new. And I think that particularly at this time, um, especially if you're unsure what you might work to unlearn, it's time to go back and listen carefully to those people who have been calling for change for a long time. People who may have been minimized or criticized or even challenged or chastised for bringing these things forward in the past. And I think now is the time to listen, to acknowledge, maybe even to apologize, so that then you can work together to unlearn and to build something stronger. And so I wanna invite for a moment, and I see that people are already using the chat, which I love. Um, I wanna invite for a moment for people to think about um, if you were going to choose to unlearn one thing, that could make your organization stronger. What might that be? Something really concrete, maybe even something within your sphere of control. And if you feel so called, or if, if you feel so bold, um, please go ahead and share in the chat one thing that you'd like to unlearn. Maybe it's a practice or an assumption that's always been in place at your organization. Um, maybe it's something within your own scope of work that you want to change, or maybe it's something personal for yourself. Oh, and I see that people are chatting to all panelists. If you want others to see it as well, please switch your chat to all panelists and attendees. 
Um, so I'm seeing already some um, that were just chatted to panelists saying um, imposter syndrome, complicity, how we value artists in our society, implicit based hiring. Great, thank you to those who are shifting. Uh, not speaking out in case my colleagues wouldn't feel I'm representing them. Mm. How we've always done things, a really common one. I wanna appreciate what Stephanie wrote. I'd like us to unlearn an unimpeachability um, or you know, in the library world, they call this vocational awe. Um, that we need to be able to question ourselves, particularly at levels of leadership. Thank you. Um, I wanna just offer briefly, and if you wanna go into it more deeply later, we can, um, a five-step process that we've been sharing um, with our members to support this idea of unlearning. And I think it first comes very simply with just clearly identifying what you want to unlearn and why, um, and as getting as specific as you can so it can be quite concrete. Then a second step would be first to do some acknowledgement of what that practice has done for you in the past. Why did it exist? Why was there a certain sense of what it meant to be professional or a certain approach to community partners? What made that, what did that make possible, even as you choose to move away from it? Then third, to start to imagine and envision what could be possible in the future. If you could unlearn this, if you could remove it as a block, what could it make possible? And then in these last couple of steps, we start to get really practical, thinking about who can be partners in this unlearning. Uh, perhaps you're like um, you, that intern with low power and you need to find partners with leverage to amplify your voice and what you want to unlearn. Or perhaps you're like that board chair and you need to find opportunities to listen to people on the front lines and their ideas which might be quite challenging to where you are. And then finally, once you have partners together, finding a small way to get started. Some really concrete things you can do right away. You know, you probably can't unlearn your program model or your way of looking at the world overnight. But you likely can pick some very specific things you could do to start moving in a direction, building momentum towards something new. So that's the first piece I wanted to offer today is this idea about finding something that you choose to unlearn. And then the second thing I wanna offer um, before we go to conversation in the choosing side is to think about who you choose to move towards. Um, to think about, especially at this time, who do you see as critical to the future of your organization? You know, when I think about communities, I often think about them as these bubbles, groups of people with something shared. Some are interconnected, but we live in a world where many communities are quite divided. And in my experience, any arts organization, really any organization, has some subset of communities who they've been engaging quite well and quite deeply for a long time. And then perhaps there are a couple of communities that you've been reaching out to or you've been interested in. Maybe you have a program, a fellowship program for young artists of color, or maybe you're partnering with one organization on the other side of town. Um, one of the things I'm seeing happen during COVID this year is a lot of arts organizations are shrinking back to focus on their longtime patrons, to remind people that they exist um, and to hopefully be able to continue to get some funding resources. And while I understand this impulse, I think it's actually quite dangerous to the long-term sustainability of our organizations. And I think that there's an alternate choice to make right now, and that is to lean into moving towards those people who you see as critical to your future. So that after the pandemic, instead of having a constituency that looks like this, you might be involving people more like this. Let me give you a quick example. Um, one of the members of our network is Casa Santa Ana. They're a small contemporary arts center in Panama City, Panama. Um, Casa Santa Ana, like a lot of contemporary art spaces, um, does a lot of exhibitions. They do projects with international artists. They do lectures and performances, mostly for an audience of local art lovers, mostly elites. But they're also situated inside the Santa Ana neighborhood, a very working class, very family oriented neighborhood. And when they opened, which was just a year ago, they said that they knew that they would be only a success if they were seen by their neighbors as part of the neighborhood, as opposed to as an elitist space plunked in the middle of it. 
And so they had this classic setup, right? Where they had some traditional communities they'd served quite well, and they had interest in engaging with local artists and with families in the neighborhood. And they had done some small things. They had done school tours for kids. They had done a couple of projects with local artists, but there was a real friction and a tension between their desires in this regard. So then COVID hit and what happened? Their traditional communities shrunk, right? International artists were not traveling. Local art lovers weren't coming out. And at the same time, they saw increased activity and possibility in the neighborhood. And they decided to go all in on pivoting during this time towards these communities who they saw as critical to their future. So just a couple ways they did that. Um, one was that they became the first food distribution site for the Santa Ana neighborhood. They raised tens of thousands of dollars. They gave away thousands of bags with food, with notes in them that said, this is from your neighbors at Casa Santa Ana, we're thinking of you. Um, and eventually they ended up putting art supplies into those bags as well. They started um, inviting people to bring back art, um, as well as to do some guerrilla art projects in the neighborhood. At the same time, they used their social media platforms to start to promote local artists in Santa Ana, illustrators who were telling their story of what the pandemic meant for them. And in these ways, they've started to build relationships to build this kind of future. And when I think about the people who are likely to be coming and participating with them after the pandemic, I think it's bigger than where they were before. And so I would invite you to think about who you see as critical to the future of your organization and how you might make some deliberate choices to prioritize them and to get to know them during this time. And the last thing I'll offer is a how to start doing that. And this is kind of conceptual, but I would invite you to think about a community first approach to working with the communities who you see as critical to your future. You know, I think often in the arts, we have this approach where we are, have an institution, we have a program, and then we find some people to sell that program to. Um, this can work really well for people who are interested, who already know about us, but it doesn't work so well often if you're talking about getting to know communities who you haven't worked with in the past. And so we suggest flipping this um, and really starting by saying, who specifically do we want to be working closely with and what could we design rooted in what matters most to them so that what the institution builds comes from the community first instead of from the institution. And so with that, I would just leave you with these three questions as we go into conversation. Um, what do you choose to unlearn? Who do you choose to move towards? And how might you change together? So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and um, you know, look forward to all of the conversation we're gonna have. Nina, thanks so much, I had to unmute. Uh, that was really great. That was um, an overview that uh, was impressive in packing in um, so much of what you all do, what you all are known for being really pro at um, and doing it in a way that was very legible, despite how um, how challenging the work is and how difficult the work is and how few kind of direct answers there are in the work. So, um, so thanks so much for that. I just remind everybody on the um, on the Zoom that uh, my name is Omari Russian Executive Director of Culture Source. You are here with us for our biannual member meeting. That was just Nina Simon of of by for all <laughs> uh, speaking with us about um, how we might think of equity in our work um, these days in the cultural sector. I encourage you all to most definitely use the Q&A and chat um, to um, ask questions now. Um, I'll be monitoring that. I also encourage you all to use um, the chat to um, say hello um, to your fellow uh, Culture First members. You know, I've been doing that. And this is our buy-in the member meeting. It's our opportunity to connect. So. Um, so please do that. Um, Nina, I would ask a kind of a fundamental question about community, and that is, um, who is community or what is the community when an organization is thinking, oh, I want to reflect my community. Um, and also that, and also like how you, how you, um, how organizations might think about who they start with, you know, mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. the who of their community. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes community gets used in this very abstract way, which either means like all those people out there or all those brown people or all those people we don't know. And, you know, we always say it's really important to get specific when you're talking about who do you mean when you're saying community. Um, and so, um, I like to say that you should get specific enough in thinking about who you're talking about when you're talking about community that you could say to a, a, a mythical, uh, well-paid intern, hey, go find six people who are in that community um, and talk to them about what matters to them. Um, and, and often what happens is we start quite broad and we say, oh, Latinx people or young people or something like that. And we have to keep circling in to get clearer about who are we talking about. So we often use three different kind of filters to start to think about how to get specific. Uh, one is geography. Are you talking about people in all of uh, the world? Are you talking about people in all of Southeast Michigan? Are you talking about people in the Northwest neighborhood? Are you talking about people who live in this particular building? Um, so getting clear on what you're thinking about about geography, getting clear what you're thinking about. Um, the second one we think about is around identity markers. So, you know, there are a variety of ways of framing that, but I like to think about it as what are things that people might say, I am X, you know, I am a woman, I'm white, I'm Jewish. Um, some people might say, say that I am an artist is an identity feeling for them. And for others, it's something they do. But thinking about, okay, you're looking for people who identify in a certain way. And then the third one we use is affinity people who like to do X. Um, so for example, there's a big difference between saying, um, you know, I think about a library we worked with um, in uh, Minnesota outside the Twin Cities, who started out saying, you know, we want to engage immigrants in our community. And it's like, okay, okay. And they're like, we're a county library. So it has to be in Dakota County. Okay, that's clear, at least the geography part. Now, immigrants, there's a lot of immigrants. What do you mean? And they said, you know, we really want to focus. We know there's a large number of Somali immigrants, first generation immigrants. We said, okay, um, can you get more specific about who you're thinking about? And they said, well, um, we're really interested in moms with small kids. Um, we see that there is a potential connection with the library. Sometimes we're seeing moms and kids come in, but we think the relationship might be kind of transactional. Um, and so thinking about this combination of how do you get clear enough, in their case, it was Somali moms with kids under 10 with an interest in you know, educational attainment in their county. Um, and then it also though speaks to your other question about like how do you pick who to start with? That we often say like you should be working at least in the beginning to get to know communities where you have some kind of logical starting point. Either you know a person in that community or maybe you see people engage sometimes, but perhaps in a very superficial or transactional way. You know, I like to say if you want to engage uh, trans Latinx teenagers who skateboard um, and you know some of them, great. But if you don't know any of them, you're probably fantasizing or imagining a community that may or may not exist or may or may not define themselves that way. We also see that a lot of organizations we work with, um, the way that the organization initially defines the community might be different from how the community defines itself. And even something small like, you know, I think about an organization in Philadelphia who uh, works with um, they do arts programming uh, with people uh, with dementia and people caring for people with dementia. And they said, hey, we really want to focus on building relationships with African-American caregivers in Northwest Philly in what they called the only neighborhood. And as they started talking to people who lived in that neighborhood, um, who were re representative of this community, they said, only, that's not the term I use to define this neighborhood. Um, that's a term that doesn't you know, describe the community I live in. And so I think that a lot of times you start with an idea of a community and then as you get to know people, you start renegotiating your understanding of who actually is this community, um, who I'm talking about. I'll also mm -hmm. say one more thing, which is it's often, we really encourage teams to get quite specific about focusing on one community to get started with. And this is often extremely painful because a lot of people are like, but there are so many communities we're not serving uh -huh. who we're interested in or whatever. And um, we really feel like if you start with one, um, then A, you know, you're more able to go deep. It's a difference between like, hosting a big buffet party versus having a one-on-one -on -one meal with somebody. Um, but also, you know, there's a, um, a definition of equity called targeted universalism. It comes out of Dr. John Powell and the Haas Institute for Belonging and Othering. And um, 
they talk about this idea that um, if you want to bring many people into an opportunity, whether it be access or, or whether it be an experience together, you have to look at who's furthest from power, who's furthest from that opportunity. And it's likely if you really get to know folks from a particular community who are far from opportunity, the changes you make to support their um, uh, opportunity are going to positively impact others as well. And so, you know, or often people say, uh, you know, the Combahee River collective idea that when black women get free, we all get free is rooted in this idea that when a particular community probably changes you make rooted in what you hear from a particular community will have positive impact for others as well. Uh, Nina, that was, um, that was, Great and classically like now it's like Nina classically um, enriched with some very specific and concrete opportunities for how people could think about this work because you know Nina I find so much that it um, it gets to a place that can feel a little abstract for folks yeah. and so many of the organizations that we talk to and we work with they just want to know well what am i supposed to do like what's the thing to do you know and because it feels like either a checklist or it feels like um uh something that can be solved not quickly but just like there's just a thing to do and it fixes it and so um so it's nice that that you've come up with frameworks for addressing that urge you know and giving people things but also kind of um existing in the in the complexity and the grayness of it all you know it's like it's tough. It is tough. Well, and I want to give, you know, huge props to my colleague Raquel, our head of program, because frankly, you know, uh, I can jump to the like, let's just get something done, you know, and my background um, as an engineer first, and then as a white museum mm. director who was making a lot of change, but um, was not always engaging the nuance. I feel like, um, frankly, it's, uh, it's something that I'm continuing to learn. And I think, you know, one of the things I bring kind of into this as a former engineer is this idea that we can do stuff. Like it can be quite complex and we can make choices and we can take some actions. And I think that um, it's about neither jumping to the checklist nor getting lost in the uh, nuance forever, um, but saying, what do I choose to change? What do I choose to do in this situation? Yeah. So, um, Nita, I'm thinking about this process of unlearning, mm -hmm. and I'm also thinking about, um, I'm going to say, boards of directors and, or in maybe general, like authorizing bodies, right? And sometimes those folks aren't either in the work as a profession or they're not on the ground. Yeah. And I guess I wonder, you know, um, within the context of nonprofit organizations, those bodies certainly have a lot to do with organizational culture and vision and those kinds of things. How does um, how does some of the things that you talked about play within within that group? And um, especially when they may be at different at uh, on different ends of a spectrum. And let me just again say that I'm thinking both of like volunteer boards and deeply like um, sophisticated smart professional staff or like a boss that's like very like visionary in the clouds, you know, and and staff that's just as like as woke as ever and on the ground. And how do how do those two in meet, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and even just the idea of what is an authorizing body um, is quite evocative and is quite racialized, right? In terms of um, who's in power and who's given what kind of uh, leash and what kind of possibility to to really make change. Um, so a couple of things I'd say. Um, one is that I think that if you can um, find ways, um, okay, let me back up. Um, absolutely, I agree with you that boards are so critical to this. And it's actually interesting that a lot of the organizations we work with, you know, people ask us, what does success look like in the Of By For All program? And um, we always say, you know, we let we support every organization in deciding for themselves what's in your change plan what are the concrete changes you want to make and there might be some organizations that say we want to build new partnerships with community partners um, you know we want to bring in x number of people as participants there might be others who say we want to change our hiring pathways and there might be others who say we want to bring three people of color onto our board or we want to bring people you know we want to shift our board next way and one thing i'll say is 
I don't, at least at this moment, have a, a theory about where to prioritize. Like, is it more important to get you know three new people on your board or is it more important to change the programming? I think what's most important is that you do the things that you are able to do that you think might have a reasonable um, shot at change. And board change is something we're particularly excited about um, and we think is quite important. Um, I have seen, and we see this in our program because we work with teams, that there often are board members on, um, on these teams who themselves are also pushing for change and feel quite marginalized within the board in doing so. Mm -hmm. And so one thing we've seen is uh, that often the teams that join our program have board members on the team for whom it's a leverage and a power boost for them as well. Um, and, and I think that uh, thinking about boards as monolithic can get you into trouble when actually often boards have brought a few people, particularly in the last few years on, who might be really hot on this, but might themselves be fighting kind of the board power around this. The other thing I'll say is uh, I was really struck yesterday by seeing a blog post where an ED of an arts organization said that a board member pulled him aside and said, um, let me let me find it because I, I don't want to, I don't want to misquote it, but um, he said that, um, hold on. Okay, now hopefully this is not, I, I've built up something that might be quite small, but um, he said that a, a board member pulled him aside and um, said um, to him, you're trying to do something that in a good economy, I would have voted down every day of the week. Um, but now is the time to experiment and be nimble and learn what we didn't know and learn how to do it better. And it's interesting that, you know, this board member was talking about during this year when nobody knows anything, um, what is the competitive advantage? If you're the kind of board member who cares about that kind of thing, perhaps this is a rare year where there's a competitive advantage in experimentation. And I would even see that we are seeing some organizations that are saying this is a rare year where there's a competitive advantage in leaning into equity, in using this time this year when we're closed to the public to really shift what's going on internally. Um, now, I do think it's entirely different, you know, the, the, uh, the working with um, people who might be resistant to change versus, as you said, the other side of the spectrum, which is when there are people who feel like all the change needs to happen right now. And, um, and I think that it's about, you know, in either one of those, like how can we be honest and clear and negotiate what changes are we ready to commit to and which ones do we think are likely to lead somewhere bigger? And I would say particularly to people on this call who feel quite urgent about change and maybe feel low power or ability um, to drive that change, um, I, I would be willing to guess that there are some authorizing folks in your organization um, who are feeling overwhelmed by everything that's going on right now and for whom if you come to them and say, hey, you've got to do this or the board's got to do this um, or I've got a million ideas of things we can do, um, it, it feels even more overwhelming. But if you can come to that authorizing body and you can say, I hear that you, I hear you saying and maybe even struggling um, around the idea that we need to move towards equity, or I hear you saying and maybe even struggling around the idea that we need to experiment this year. I have some ideas specifically that I would be ready to take the lead on to do X. I think that executives and authorizing bodies listen to that differently because it sounds more like you're solving their problem as opposed to serving them up a new one. Yeah, thanks for saying that. This, and um, you know, both give, giving energy to um, to uh, a certain set of folks in organizations just being at, being overwhelmed with all that, all the possibility and all the work, and um, and the way that um, folks in all dimensions of an organization can really be um, allies to that colleague, that leader, um, in just the way that they frame their willingness to be part of the progress that happens in organizations. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that's great. So um, I'm going to ask then one more question uh, for for now. Nina, I have so much. Um, you know, you the, the panel. Of, <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, we will. Um, if you have questions, just continue to kind of keep them coming, or be ready when we move into our kind of member exchange in the breakout rooms. Just we can dialogue there too. Nina, I was struck by your comment about your example about the Panama City. Mm -hmm. Of course, being a native Floridian born and raised in Tallahassee, Florida, um, I thought you were going to, it was an example about Panama City, Florida, but 
Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, part of that started out with this idea that um, the, as the organization was thinking about its community, it was thinking about, well, what are the range of things need and what are different kinds of services that we can provide that aren't necessarily just like right. arts services. And so I guess, um, are you seeing examples of that regularly of, of um, organizations that traditionally present, produce, exhibit art going outside of that in ways that have felt very successful or felt like they've been able to make really meaningful connections? Yes, and I think that taking that community first approach is really critical to it because what I've seen some institutions do, I mean, we've seen for decades, right, organizations um, create programming, you know, uh, Friday night programming is often or weekend, you know, late night programming for young people was a huge thing for a while, right? And, um, but I what I would say is, some of that has been incredibly successful and deep. But some of it has been another version of an institution assuming and guessing what a particular community might want and serving it to them um, as consumers. And I think that what I've seen lead to deeper relationships is when you start by going out and talking to folks in the community and seeing what um, comes from their experience that wants to come in. And so, you know, a Florida example I think about is. Um, one of the members that's been with us the longest is the History Miami Museum. And um, one of the first projects they did with us was rooted around this fact that they were doing an exhibition called Out Miami about the history of um, you know, gay people and gay activism in Miami. And they said, um, we want to involve LGBT youth in this exhibition. But what they said was, we are not gonna start with an assumption about how to involve them, that we should do a teen night or that there should be a teen project or whatever it was. They said, we wanna get to know um, LGBT youth. They got to know a couple of key uh, organizations in the community that were seen as you know, youth-driven safe spaces. And they um, got to know those youth um, and, and to ask them, we, we use this tool we call partner power around really understanding what does power and success look like for that partner? You know, what matters to them? What, what values do they have? What barriers are they facing? Um, and what commitments can they make? And so getting to know youth and then even doing a tour. And I just really remember Tina Menendez, their director of education, they're saying, we did not assume when they first came to, when we came to their meeting and then when they came to visit us, we did not assume that they were going to be part of this exhibition in a particular way or even that they were going to be part of it at all. What we were asking was, um, you know, what is a version of sharing your story, of being creative, of, of sharing your history um, that feels like it would be, um, you know, a, an opportunity for you as opposed to something that benefits us where we're transacting with you. And so in that case, you know, the youth said, hey, we want to build, we want to make art that is in the exhibition. Um, they ended up shifting over time past the exhibition to do other projects together. Um, and they really built a sustainable and ultimately, you know, also a, a project that could get funding that was rooted though the sustainability came from the fact that it wasn't the institution saying we've got a great opportunity or program for you new people it was them saying we're curious we're humble we're ready to make changes based on what you tell us um and so what does really feeling belonging uh gonna look like for you mm -hmm. um no super um super solid uh nina folks on the on on the on the zoom i would um Adam just, um, colleague Adam just posted our ideas board. Um, Adam, if you could pop that link into the chat again, that'd be great. I encourage you all to go on there. It's, a, it's kind of a live dynamic um, digital space for you to post, vote up, um, like questions um, that you have for Nina or questions that you're just kind of thinking about yourself that um, as a whole, just gonna, you know, paint a picture of what how we're all thinking and and feeling about this moment. So I encourage you to use that idea um, idea board. Um, and before I turn it over to Adam to um, get us into our kind of green room breakout room um, session, I just um, you know, Nina, I just want to thank you so much for um, for being with us in, in this portion and, and, you know, sharing these ideas. Um, you know, the thing, you know, I have all these questions and the thing that's like the most glorious part of this 
is that you are a colleague to all of us, you know, you and your, um, and the team members at of by for all um, are a real resource to our sector. And so none of us have to feel like this is the only time we get to connect or that we get to talk to you. Um, you all have um, positioned yourself and proven yourselves to be a real national resource. And so I'm so, um, I'm so thankful for that, that we have that. And, um, and just, again, really appreciate um, you being with us today. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. And yeah, I just put that link again, which is both where you can get the slides, but also you can get kind of hooked up with some resources um, and tools we have. And, you know, I, I'd say that like the greatest um, way um, or the greatest thing that's inspiring me these days is how individuals and organizations are making specific choices for something that you're ready to change. And it doesn't have to be big. Maybe you want to say, hey, we want to let's unlearn using the word community generically and let's change to being specific. Or let's unlearn this idea that we always make decisions in a particular way or we have this particular assumption. Um, or let's, you know, let's take a stand. Let's let's go ask that person what matters to them instead of guessing. And, and so I feel like um, I, I hope for all of us that we can absorb and be in this world of incredible complexity and challenge right now, and that we can choose daily, really deliberate things we wanna to work to change, um, because I know that's what gets me up in the morning and particularly hearing stories um, from all of my colleagues around the world, um, all of y'all about what you're doing to choose to change. So thank you. Choose to change. I love it. Uh, Adam Desjardins, I'm Desjardins. turning it over to you to help us transition. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Nina. And thanks. Thanks, Omari. And thanks, everybody, for, for chatting. And, you know, it's kind of it's like a true virtual member meeting, which is really great to see all the activity. Um, so I'm going to describe our next sort of bit of logistical wizardry, um, which is joining our um, uh, 30 minute, well, at this point now, 23 minute little breakout room moment. Um, so I've just sent in the chat box a debrief call Zoom link. So what you'll wanna do is you can click that link. It'll prompt you to leave this webinar. Don't worry, if you do leave it, you'll be able to get back because I'll put the link in the other call. Um, so you won't get lost in the ether. Um, so feel free to click that link, join our other call. We'll do some breakout rooms and um, have people, you know, introduce themselves and maybe just talk about how they're thinking of this work of unlearning and also, you know, being more specific about community and just also everything that we talked about. Um, so we'll be able to, you know, hear from what's on your mind and chat with some of your colleagues. Um, so feel free to join us there. Um, if not, I'll be putting up a timer so you can just, you know, pause the meeting, step away for 20 minutes and come back. So it's really choose your own bliss here. Um, so again, feel free to click that link and join us there. And if not, um, we'll meet you back here in about 20 minutes. But again, thanks, Nina. And thanks to you and your team. And um, we'll see you in the breakout rooms. Folks, um, we are uh, very happy to have you all with us as we are, are broadcasting and have been broadcasting <laughs> for this little bit. Thanks so much for, um, for joining us in our member exchange breakout rooms. Again, you are at the Culture Source Biannual Member Meeting, Culture Source being a coalition of cultural organizations and creative people um, based in Detroit, serving Southeast Michigan. Uh, I am, you know, the conversation that we had in our breakout room was really fantastic, um, continuing to kind of riff on ideas and energy from me and Simon of, of By For All. And we're moving that now into a conversation, um, presentation um, with Delug Smith, the executive director of the Lewis Prize for Music. Um, part three of our biennial member meeting. And I'll just say that, you know, I began my professional career in the arts, um, managing a K-12 arts education program at UMS and um, uh, was really kind of, I was nervous about starting that role because I didn't think I wanted to work with kids and teachers and all that in, in the arts. I wanted to be with artists and, you know, the sexy stuff backstage, all that. But um, it turned out to be very, very, very rewarding for me. And I'm, um, and, um, um, really proud to have um, have served um, young people and the educational community through um, through that work. Um, since that time, I've continued to see the field of um, 
of arts education and now creative youth develop, development um, uh, evolve. And I'm really pleased to have Delug here with us um, as he has now a fairly newish role um, as both um, the leader, um, the executive director of this organization, and also um, an organization that's really helping create some systems change within creative youth development nationally to, um, to tell us what, you know, what he's seeing, um, maybe what he predicts from the future and, and what we all might um, um, have an opportunity to know and learn so we might serve and work with and partner with youth and young folks in our communities even better. We will also have a few practitioners based in Southeast Michigan um, share with us as well later. I'll introduce them in a little bit, but um, first I'll, I'll toss it to you, Delug. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Omari. And, um, you know, full transparency, Omari uh, just this summer joined the board of directors of the Lewis Prize and has been a great addition. Uh, we're super, super proud of having him be part of our com community. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share some slides, follow that little routine that, that Nina got us started with, get into the present mode here. Um, just for those of you uh, that don't know me, first of all, I'm born in Michigan. Um, I'm currently in California. I've been in California since middle school, but um, uh, born in Lansing. And so that's really a personal pleasure for me to be speaking with you all today. Um, started doing theater as a very young person there um, at Lansing Community College at Boar's Head Theater in Lansing and have basically lived my entire life since I was eight years old in the arts. Um, but really only for the last two years have I been in a role that's associated with funding. Uh, previously, just pre prior to this, I was the CEO of the San Diego Youth Symphony and Conservatory for 13 years. Previous to that uh, was the associate director of a classical music festival. And prior to that was a production stage manager uh, at regional theater here in San Diego, California. So I uh, have had a range of arts experiences that have accumulated uh, into this opportunity that I'm really excited to uh, both describe to you, not so much the Lewis Prize, though I will go a little bit into that, but really the, the area of the arts that we are paying the most attention to and doing a lot to try and elevate and why it is we're trying to do that. So let me just first give you a little bit of an overview of the Lewis Prize itself. Oh, the formatting is a little off here. Um, so I'll have to describe what's underneath. But uh, Daniel Lewis, who I think is actually listening in today, um, is our chair and founder. Uh, Daniel is from Cleveland originally, longtime supporter of orchestras. Uh, and in really the last five years has shifted his philanthropy extensively away from orchestras toward arts education and creative youth development. The Lewis Prize is a five-year commitment that he has made um, to invest a total of $20 million into the work that we're supporting. We gave our first awards, uh, which included three $500,000 multi-year accelerator awards in January. Uh, we did not anticipate, but very quickly um, responded very quickly. to the COVID reality by issuing a um, community response grant. And I'll describe a little bit about what that looked like. Um, we gave $1.25 million uh, in $25,000 and $50,000 grants to 32 organizations across the country of all sizes. Um, and then uh, who have we been giving those resources to? We've been giving them to creative youth development. Uh, creative youth development is a very, very equity oriented arts education movement and field. This term creative youth development is really not even 10 years old, uh, was sort of codified uh, in 2014, but it really is describing work that has been going on for generations, if not truly eons of human development. Um, but this is sort of its most contemporary descriptor. Um, and we'll talk about again, why, why would I say it's contemporary descriptor of work that's been going on for such an extended period of time. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanna highlight that because we are focused on young people, we have very purposefully incorporated young people throughout our process, uh, serving as readers and panel members and helping bring insight. And so uh, we have been working with a whole group of, of emerging professionals under 25 years old, helping with our processes. Our mission, I've got it written out here and no, read, no, need, no need for me to repeat what you can read. 
Um, but I do want to just highlight that our, our kind of fundamental notion here is that when adults in a community invest in the creative development of young people, those young people become important and change-making individuals in their own communities and really thrive as members of their own community and bring their creative voices to their community's needs and ambitions. Uh, we actually did a whole series of national convenings and there were two meetings in Detroit in early 2018. Uh, other meetings that occurred were in Boston, New York, San Antonio, Los Angeles, uh, Miami, Chicago. And so I just wanted to share with you that um, we have very gratefully uh, benefited from the, the experience, the intelligence, the culture of Detroit um, and Parsons at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra pulled all of these folks together to contribute to the genesis of the Lewis Prize for Music. All of that pre-work ultimately landed us on this, this field of creative youth development. And creative youth development, as you can see here, is a blending of artistic instruction, artistic excellence, and variously defined, right? All, all kinds of artistic mediums and musical mediums um, look at different characteristics of their, of their practice and name that as excellence. So we don't, we don't have our own definition of excellence. We're really focused on what, is the, what are the musicians and the cultural community that we are supporting? How do they define excellence? excellence? But also this connecting of this artistic practice with positive youth development and, and the kind of full dimension of what is entailed in achieving positive youth development. And you can find more information at this website uh, at your leisure, creativeyouthdevelopment.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, to get to CYD or creative youth development, we actually did quite a bit of work examining the intersection between musical practice and human rights. And we believe that this particular practice is very, very closely connected to the fulfillment of human rights. And that if we, we want our communities to actually be strong and thriving, then everyone in those communities need to have full access to everything that is entailed in living a full and complete life. And so uh, we've actually looked at how, and we, we will see as we continue, how is it that, that human rights actually manifests in the context of, a, of an artistic learning environment. Creative youth development students uh, are really all students, um, however, the field has particularly grown up in recognition of the needs of young people who are historically and consistently under-resourced, um, systems impacted, marginalized. So I'm giving you just a few examples of ways in which young people get, get marginalized. Uh, I don't think any of this will be a surprise to you, but uh, you know, for example, young people that are in foster care systems uh, tend to have less access to other resources. And these are not just material resources. These are also relational resources. And the, the ability to have a consistent uh, learning experience or uh, creative practice is also a challenge. And in some settings, uh, there's actually no access. So the creative use development field has really grown to bring access to places where uh, creative opportunities don't exist. And I just wanna share one statistic from the National Endowment for the Arts that we've been referencing. Uh, they, in their arts participation study uh, that came out just after 2008, they shared that between 1982 and 2008, the number of young adults who are young adults of African-American or they term Hispanic background the percentage that indicated they had access to an arts education experience while they were growing up dropped by 50%. Went from um, the low 60s down into the 20s and the 30s, respectively for these groups. At the same time, white young adults who reported that they did not have access to, or that they did, sorry, the white young adults who reported they had access to arts education 
um, that percentage dropped by 1%. So this is absolutely an equity issue and creative youth development has been work working hard to address this inequity. In the creative youth development field, musical genres are very broad and diverse and it would really be impossible to list all of them. Uh, so I've listed many, uh, but I really wanna highlight down at the bottom this indication that there are so many culturally specific and local traditional genres and musical forms that get taught in creative youth development. And in this respect, it really is, stands in contrast to the kind of mono culture of music education and coming from a youth symphony background, uh, I can speak to having seen that, that um, kind of standard Western musical instruction is what dominates in the schools. It's not, uh, it's not that other forms don't exist in schools, but they tend to get much less resource, much, much less opportunity to grow. And so creative youth development is not just bridging an access to instruction gap, it's actually also bridging an access to culturally relevant music making gap that exists. This is uh, this area of the human development side of CYD is equally important to us as is the artistic aspects of CYD. And I, I wanna highlight here the top two, the trust, the family, uh, this work is relationship work. It is multi-year work. It is not a workshop and you've learned some skills and you move on. This is, this is really about building up opportunities for young people, creating opportunities for young people to have sustained relationships, have a sustained learning experience, and ultimately have, have pathways to opportunities that so many uh, middle class and upper class young people have and, and particularly, again, Caucasian young people have. So uh, you can see there are so many different characteristics here to how creative youth development practitioners think about the connection between what they're offering and the overall long-term development of young people. And I think you'll see here that a number of these activities very explicitly connect to the human rights list that I posted earlier. So uh, at, at, the, at the Lewis Prize, we, as I mentioned, gave our first awards in January. Uh, and I'm excited to say that we are cultural creators, uh, Michael, Re Michael Reyes, or Reyes as I know him, um, and Liz Stone were two of our uh, finalists who then were selected for Infusion Awards. Um, they did not receive the $500,000 award I mentioned earlier. Uh, we gave them a $50,000 Infusion Award. Um, and with that award, they actually um, were eligible to reapply for the Lewis Prize. And so we are currently in our, in our 2021 cycle. We'll be naming the uh, finalists uh, later this fall and the awardees again in early January. In addition, then, we also, as I mentioned, did our com COVID Community Response Fund. And unlike so many uh, funds that we saw that were arts-related funds, um, we were not actually giving grants for the survival, quote unquote, survival of the arts organizations. What we were doing was prioritizing organizations that were actually stepping up to serve their communities even more robustly and more clearly in all of these areas, whether that was food support for young people, access to technology and Wi-Fi for their academic enrollments, um, the uh, mental health supports that are being provided by so many of these programs. So they all, like every program that we heard from was going virtual in terms of their programming, but they were not all stepping further into these spaces of need. And so our, our commitment was for those organizations that are not retracting, that are not um, basically walking away from this moment of crisis, but are actually walking into it. Uh, we wanted to give them extra support and we did all of that in, in early June so that they had that to carry them uh, further into the summer. This will give you some idea of, uh, we don't have a lot of data yet to share on those applicants, but this will give you some idea, idea of, uh, these are the percentage of students from, that the organizations identified as coming from a 
backgrounds that were historically are historically marginalized. And you can see the green here, uh, that's the category of organizations that are serving between 80 and 100% students from uh, these backgrounds uh, are granting clearly prioritized those organizations. So this was very, again, very much an equity oriented effort to ensure that the young people who have the least access, the least opportunity, the least resource, uh, we're getting more resource and more opportunity and more support. Uh, we had four grantees in Michigan. Very excited to share uh, those with you here today. And um, and I just want to say as well that that um, Damien from Crescendo Detroit uh, participated in one of our early uh, convenings last year, 2019, to help define how we would how we would undertake the uh, Lewis Prize and um, the folks at the Tetra have participated in the community meetings that we had there. And so for us, it's very exciting to have uh, both an opportunity to learn from members of the Detroit community and then likewise to be able to reinvest back into the Detroit and the Southwest and Western Michigan communities. So both a thank you and a congratulations to these folks. Uh, the the sort of going forward, what is creative youth development looking like um, now? These areas that I've just listed here are some of the kind of newer areas of work or and or amplified. They've grown in these areas of work um, because there, again, is a need in communities that these organizations are seeing. There's a need for young people to receive supports and or a need for political engagement. And I should say too, the young people are pushing for those kinds of political engagements. And so uh, the organizations that are doing this work with, with them, uh, again, it's not just work for young people, it's work with young people. Uh, they are absolutely stepping into these spaces and stepping in in ways that are, that are filling gaps that our larger uh, kind of government structures uh, have managed to miss. Um, and one might even say are designed to miss. Uh, so these organizations, as they have for a long time, uh, been engaged in, in finding, finding areas of, of need and stepping into those are doing that again in the context of 2020 in a, in a very, very substantial way. And then lastly, I just wanna sort of say like, what, what is really the future? What is coming out of creative youth development that really is the portent for the long-term character of America uh, as, our, as our perspective. And that is, uh, first of all, the way in which these organizations work, uh, the, the cultural, cultural roots that these organizations are connected to, and also the local roots that they're connected to. Uh, Multi-generational, this is really important. And I, and I particularly, we're trying to help other funders and foundations see that when they talk about supporting artists of color, that a huge piece of that is also recognizing that in non-Western uh, cultural traditions, uh, generational transference of knowledge, a generational co-cultural practice is very common. And the notion that supporting an artist of color without recognizing that they in, in all probability are also a teacher within their own community and that that, that is a, a equally fundamental part of their practice as any kind of presentational activity that they're doing. Um, the creative use development is that space where that practice is happening. And so, you know, we're, we're very much encouraging those that are now more aggressively saying that they're focused on artists of color to recognize that that also means young people of color who, who have relationship with these artists and are learning from these artists. Uh, these other aspects that are that are described here should also be familiar to you in terms of what does what does community practice look like feel like uh, I think that a number of the ideas that Nina was sharing earlier are really represented here uh, and the last thing I would say is uh, what I've actually come to learn in this past year and a half or two years of doing this work with the Lewis Prize after doing my work at the Youth Symphony where we where we helped rebuild arts education in school systems, um, 
creative youth development and community organizing are actually in some respects, the same practice. And so I, I kind of wanna offer up a kind of fundamental challenge to uh, everyone, which is how is it that your artistic practice or the artistic activity of your organization actually relates to community organizing for the betterment of, of the, the people that you are in um, community with, in geography with, in proximity with, uh, that the community organizing really is the, the driver of change in the United States and creative youth development is very much on par and a kind of parallel practice with that. So I'm gonna take down my slides and pass it back to Omari to I think prompt some reactions to everything I've shared. Dilute, thanks so much. Um, Dilute, can you hear me by the way? Yes. Perfect. Um, Thanks so much for that. And then so much of what you said um, uh, has this um, really beautiful elision with, um, with Nina's presentation. In particular, I'm thinking about that example that I used, or the example that I mentioned about the Panama City work that she was doing, where the work of an arts organization was not just the presentation of artwork or the curation or the exhibition, but it goes much more into the dimensions of community organizing, providing services that are just relevant to the people outside of your building's doors or that kind of thing. And so, um, and so um, among the many really interesting, fascinating things you shared, um, that's a, a, an interesting through line that I'm sure that our two, um, our friends and, and peers and colleagues in Southeast Michigan might also have something to say about. Um, so um, just to get a, a, a two reactions from the field, um, here, um, I'll first um, start by introducing Delacay Strada from Mosaic Youth Theatre of Detroit, the executive director there, to um, offer her insights about um, creative, youth, creative youth development, um, their work at Mosaic, and, um, and what she heard from Delug and, and, and the Lewis Prize and how that resonates. Um, Delacay, we are ready for you. And again, folks, I should just say that again, this is Culture Source. I'm Omari Rush, the Executive Director, um, and you're with us for our biannual member meeting. Thanks for being here, Delisha. Thank you for having me and greetings to all of you. I hope that this time finds your heart light. Um, there are so many things that resonate um, with me. I think one of the, the main points that we often discuss is the um, driver of creative youth development being young people uh, and that core element of CYD is it being youth centered but centering youth voice. Um, young people are experts at their own experience and so yes we're hearing a lot um, as advocates and allies of young people about the the times that we're in and how challenging it is to navigate um, being someone who has so much to say about how all of these decisions are be, are impacting them but who have seemingly little power um, because they aren't of voting age to um, be heard and have people think about them specifically when voting um, so one of the things that I often encourage people to interrogate is how do we, as those that are privileged, privileged enough to be at the table, disrupt systems enough to support youth being not only in the room where it's happening, but equally voting members at the table, um, as opposed to consistently making decisions for them, um, making decisions alongside them. And I think that's really important. Um, I am an alum of a CYD program so I had the opportunity to have those experiences at a very young age, and it drastically impacts your agency, um, not just in your own experience, but your experience as a community minded citizen. And so I just I think it's really important and I know it's difficult right um, as uh, adults who have been brought up in these systems so often it's difficult for us to expand our thinking about how things can be done differently. But I think that as, um, I think it's our responsibility um, to not only listen, but to also enact change. So um, I'm excited about the work that's being done nationally as well as locally. Um, 
to start things up a bit. It's it's important to to stir the pot, and I I do think while um, COVID nineteen in particular has been very challenging, it has also created um, space and time for people to really reflect about how they are um, contributing to or being complicit in things that they don't necessarily appreciate or or are seemingly against, but have operated in for a very long time. Thank you for that. That was great. Um, I'm going to ask your um, your colleague, uh, Heather Martin, Executive Director of the Youth Arts Alliance. Um, I would say an Ypsilanti, but um, Heather and her work serves a pretty um, broad uh, geography that certainly is, is rooted in Southeast Michigan, but, um, but does so much. Uh, Heather, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Mari. Thank you, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know, Youth Arts Alliance provides healing-centered arts workshops to young people across Michigan. We consistently redefine what it means to invest in communities by listening to and taking direction from the young people. We serve um, our cohort of teaching artists, respond to the visions and creative aspirations of young people, meeting them where they are. And this has really been a wonderful gathering. I, um, I'm so appreciative of everyone's insights and it's so great to hear from Lewis Prize and their direction for funding and um, De Lachey, I can't agree more. Now more than ever, I think we need to be paying attention to what young people are asking for. So Youth Arts Alliance, we provide Arts workshops to young people, really our start was um, to your point, um, Deluge, about human rights, arts as human rights. Um, we served young people who are incarcerated in our beginning and it was from their direction that they asked us to be offering programming and workshops in the community. So what we discovered in our evaluation and in conversation with young people is that the majority of their artistic experiences were happening while they were incarcerated, which was a shock to hear despite knowing the inequity of arts and cultural resources and investment in neighbors, neighborhoods and um, communities. And so from their direction to say, I want to have these arts experiences, um, in my community, I don't want the best arts experience of my adolescent to be sourced from the place that's incarcerating me. Um, and so in doing that, we set out to um, develop programming in partnership with lots of organizations and communities. In fact, the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation in their In Our Neighborhood grant funded the development of a state-of-the-art music recording studio at Park Ridge Community Center. And in doing that, we partnered with the African American Subcontractors Association in the building out of that studio, also in partnership with mental health organizations, um, other organizations serving youth um, transitioning out of foster care. And I think it's important, um, your point about community organizing not being separate from youth development. So, um, so in the goal of the African American Subcontractors Association to drive young people into trades, they helped build the studio itself while we supported and employed young people who were vested in the studio itself to be trained and mentored in those trade skills. And so I think arts has so much interwoven capacity and connective capacity for other organizations. That is that we can hold our expertise as teaching artists, as an arts organization. Um, and we can also invite in other organizations who have priorities and who have goals for young people and supporting young people in different ways. Um, so 
beyond working with young people who are currently incarcerated, we are now programming in alternative high schools, community settings, um, health centers. And in doing that, we're, we're seeking to, of course, be in spaces that are preventative, right? That young people may in the investment of the arts be disrupted from systemic um, oppressive systems that drive them towards incarceration. Um, and, in, and in doing this work, it's also important for us to understand that the incentives are not of our own creation without young people telling us what matters most to them. So young people told us, I need a job. I need, to, I need income for my family and for myself. So our work in the community employs young people to contribute through public art. Um, young people told us my school has been dramatically disrupted by involvement um, in the foster care system and the juvenile justice system. Our programming earns young people high school credits in partnership with ed local educators and intermediate school districts. Young people told us that their families were being significantly harmed by system involvement, fractured relationships, um, stunted ability to um, be connected to siblings. So we invited families to participate in programming both inside locked residential facilities and also in communities. So what does it mean to invite the whole family to be a part of um, artistic practice and process that's driven by young people. Um, and, and, and I also, I also want to make space to say that um, a lot of times organizations see um, youth driven or youth leadership as creating a, a youth board. And I would, I would argue against that. Um, please, maybe the last thing you do for youth involvement be in the founding of a youth board, unless you have a very clear idea about how that invests in them and their trajectory and their goals for their communities. Um, we at Youth Arts Alliance do a lot of intentional project-based work. For example, a young person who was involved in our programming for a number of years while incarcerated was released and had deep interest in becoming a facilitator themselves. Hollywood is now facilitating workshops with us and she's driven a project toward Sycamore Meadows in Ypsilanti where the Tenants Association has requested of local organizations ways that young people can be engaged in healthy, happy, um, creative activities. Um, Hollywood is now leading a poetry project where we've provided all of the art supplies and is supporting young people in that neighborhood to develop poetry of their own. Um, but I'm just so grateful to be here and frankly um, to have space to talk about these things. So thank you for having me. Heather, um... Thanks so much for that. Um, it's so refreshing to hear both you and Delishree talk about um, your work and your vision for um, for young people and their um, their contributions to the world as like human beings. You know, it's great. Um, so um, I'm going to ask the the panel a, a question. Adam is um, also um, putting into the chat a link to our idea um, board. I would encourage you all on the um, on the Zoom call to, you know, um, click on the link and go and post, um, you know, question that you have about the work um, that you're just thinking about yourself, um, that you just want to share with the world or that you have for any one of the speakers. Um, we just like to collect those ideas and just see where they're at and where people are at. I will um, ask the, we have five minutes left. And so I'll just ask anyone on the panel to quickly um, respond to this idea about um, what it means to work with youth and um you know if anybody on the call is thinking oh we should more meaningfully engage um young folks in our work um how do we do that um what's a, a an expectation that you have what's an expectation that folks on the on the zoom call might have for what that looks like 
And um, in particular, maybe the ways that it can be um, a little messy, you know, gloriously messy, but a little messy. Anybody have any insights? Delug, I will say, um, to the room, um, originally asked that um, youth be included in this, um, um, you know, again, centering youth voice. Um, that didn't quite work out, but um, so I just throw that out to um, to um, the panelists. Reyes, thanks so much for joining. We'll holler in a sec. Delug, Delachey, Heather, thoughts? I could just, I have one really quick thing to say is whatever project you're working on, invite youth to be at the table. Like it's not a complicated process. And be Agreed. part of the participants. Agreed. And I think asking them in what way they want to be engaged or not. Um, I think also it's important that you build relationships so that they understand that you asking is a sincere ask and not a, uh, an indication that you expect that they participate or that there's going to be um, any fallback if they do not. Heather, maybe you have a thought on that too? I, I echo, um, I echo um, both of those comments. And I would also say that um, as messy as adolescence appears to those who aren't proximate to it. <laughs> um, maybe because you're really old. No, um, not because you're really old. Um, but um, adolescence is, is emergent kinetic visionary space. And I think that um, we do a disservice to young people um, when we expect um, their ideation and vision to fit into our framework, our programming model, our goals, our objectives, our shared outcomes. I think it is much more important to ask the question of what young people would like to see for their community communities defined community by them. Um, and then sit back, listen, and use all that framework, all of that, um, all of our knowledge of systemic funding and fundraising, um, it's, it's the job of adults to leverage the resources and knowledge we have about the greater framework towards the vision and ideas of young people and not vice versa. So not inviting young people to the table um, uh, to, to check boxes um, for our own um, sort of strategic plan or goal, um, but quite the opposite. Uh, thank you all for that. Um, we've just nearly reached time. I see that Reyes has just joined us. Um, and so what we'll do is I will, um, I'll ask Reyes to just so that we have beaconed Heather and Delache and now Reyes as peers and colleagues and friends in our sector. I'll ask him to say 30 seconds about we are culture creators and um, and then we will um, we'll close out. Thank you all so much. Reyes. Yeah, I apologize. You. I hope you guys can hear me. I'm like in a back alley, but uh, I was working with Royce Defy Nine today on some sound for his mental health project. But we are culture creators is an arts and activist entrepreneurship program based in Detroit. Uh, we focus on young adults, 18 to 24. We also have a focus between 13 and 18, two different tiers. We really just produce music, shows, events, and kind of show a pathway for young artists to professionalize their skills and become a professional in music, entertainment, or art. I think that was 30 seconds, Perfect. right? Okay. That was pretty, that, like um, Kim, um, my colleague Kim um, Howard and uh, Adam Peter Deb, we were all taking notes about that, um, that concise way to talk about your work. We're trying to do that better at Culture Shirts ourselves. Uh, again, um, you know, thank you all. I'm, I continue to be very inspired by the work of um, creative youth development and the work that you all are doing. And, um, and it's great to have you all on the ground here as resources and certainly Deluge. Um, I'm looking at your box, Delug. What um, what you're doing at um, at the Lewis Price for Music with a super solid team of um, volunteer board members and staff and Dan Lewis. It's all um, it's really tremendous, and it's all you know. I believe in this all ability to all come together and and get us to a, a really great place. Um, with that, folks, I will thank you all for 
participating in our biannual member meeting, Culture Sources biannual member meeting, and um, and hope to see you uh, more in the coming weeks and days and months and hours, all the things, all the places. Um, have a really great day and um, and be well.